Generation Z. The kids have an attention span of eight seconds. Is it possible to communicate anything in eight seconds? Let's give it a try. So who are we? Well, we're the kids born after 1995, born into a post-9-11 world. When the war on terror started, we were starting school. We're younger than Google, the first generation to have grown up with social media. We consume in eight-second bites. To us, 30 seconds is an eternity. I don't think I would have been able to live without Google and the internet. We uh, live more through devices than we do actual interaction. A nightmare? Not if you know them. Gen Y grew up in a time of plenty, but the uncertainty of the noughties changed all of that. Gen Z is a new species. We're not called Tony or Shelley or Kevin. We're called Logan and Romeo and Malala. We don't consume on two screens, we use five. No text, highly visual. To everyone else, the way we function seems like so random, but to us, it's as natural as breathing. We don't have a lot of faith in experts. We're not interested in the wisdom of the grey hairs. We just want to get it off Google or from our peers. Some say we're fickle, but we do have our good points. We're highly connected, and we're not just tech savvy, it's in our genes, or should we say, our code. We're collaborative, and we're more mature and more resourceful than Gen Y. At 18, Beth Riekel shared her first book online, and she landed a three-book deal with Random House. If our idea of a career doesn't exist, we'll just create it in our bedrooms. 15-year-old Maya van Wagenven bucked the old order, landing a film deal with DreamWorks after self-publishing her school memoirs. It's a DIY culture. We're pretty entrepreneurial. 18-year-old Nick Deloisio is our poster boy. He created the news app Sumly at 15 and just sold it to Yahoo for 30 million. We witnessed our parents struggle in a crumbling job market, so we plan to make our skills pay off as soon as possible. At the ripe old age of 17, Lord won two Grammys, and now she's been hired to score the next Hunger Games. If you think we sound shallow, don't be fooled. We want to make a real difference to the world. Teen activists like Taliban shooting victim Malala Yousafzai are reaching out to millions. So just when you thought you'd got your head around Gen Y, Gen Z comes along and changes everything. Every eight seconds. Take any longer, they turn into generation... All right, thanks, sir. So, uh, Joe Bass, and on behalf of my boss, Major General Leahy, I want to congratulate each of you guys for making it to this pinnacle of your careers. Um, I play that video because I kind of want you guys to understand where our thought process is. When it comes to the folks that are coming into the United States Air Force and the folks that Sonia talked about, those are the folks that are coming in. How many of you guys have some, a child that's 18 or older? So you know. Even if you have a child, I would submit to you, that's probably five years old, they can probably navigate a device better than you. So we've got to, when it comes to training, education, development, we have got to relook at how we do that. And so I don't have slides here, so it's kind of all going downhill from the time Chief Lee spoke and then ET and, and now us. But I just want us to have a conversation so that you can kind of understand how we're looking at things within Second Air Force. So within Second Air Force, after our trainees come into, uh, after our trainees leave the recruiting station, 93% of all United States Airmen come into Second Air Force through BMT. So last year we had about 36,000 airmen that came into BMT. Only 35,000 graduated. So some of them don't make the cut. Sometimes that's because of medical or, or, or what have you, but they don't make the cut. And then they transition to tech training. So they're going to go to f potentially five of our wings that we have. Shepherd Air Force Base. Where's sh folks from Shepherd at? Hua. Goodfellow Air Force Base. Lackland Air Force Base tech training. So it's not just home of BMT. It's home of tech training as well. And we also have our brand new wing, Special Warfare Training Wing. Do we have anybody from there? Who? What am I missing? Keesler Air Force Base, where I'm at. Where's Keesler? All right. So, so they're going to go to one of those locations or one of our over 70 detachments worldwide. And they're going to spend, or our, our, we have Vandenberg here, I know, Port Wanimi as well. So they're going to go to one of those locations to tech training. Tech training can be... A, from two weeks all the way up to a year and a half. We've got folks who will go to Presidio of Monterey and do language training 
for upwards of a year and then go to Goodfellow Air Force Base. So again, fundamentally in 2nd Air Force, we're looking at how can we change the way we do training based on the generation of airmen that we're getting. We have folks who've never failed in their lives. Never failed. They go to Presidio Monterey and for their first time ever, they failed Russian or Urdu. Or they fail at Shepherd Air Force Base. That's a challenge. So you are going to see, and you probably already see, and, and the Operational Air Force has to understand, we have a different airman coming in. How many of you guys here, what is going on in tech training? Why are they sending those airmen to us? I've heard that several times this week, that question posed to us, and I would submit to you, when you look at the airmen that we're getting from, from recruiting, and oh, by the way, qualified folks that have made it from recruiting Two basic training, and we have them for eight and a half weeks. For those of you all who have kids that are over 18 years old, how many of you can change some habits in eight and a half weeks? We're going to give them a good dose of what it means to wear this uniform and why it's so important to wear this uniform. And as they transition to tech training, and you guys heard the briefing from our two chiefs up here, as they transition to tech training, we're going to infuse in them their functional expertise and we're going to fuse in, fuse in them some airmanship but as our chiefs shared with you guys where's the rest of that training occur in the squadrons i don't remember my tech training instructors but i do remember my first line supervisor so that's where our focus is shifting um training i want to leave some time for questions what i'll share with you is just some um things that I've shared with your career field managers recently, and that is the changes that we had in BMT. Um, Lee Hoover already shared that with you guys, and again, reminding you, we don't have an airman's week at the end. We infused airmanship throughout basic training. In three weeks, four weeks, we're going to, where are you at? Chief Lambert, we're going to have an airmanship review. So Chief Lambert's going to lead that review. We're in, we've invited PME folks, PACE folks, CAAs, USAFA to come with us so that we can look at airmanship. How are we delivering airmanship in today's Air Force? So 2nd Air Force owns airmanship 100 and 200, but then your CAAs deliver a 300. We're looking at potentially a 400, 500, but nobody ever looks at it together. So we're going to bring all the parties in here. We're going to holistically deliver and, and look at how are we looking at airmanship. Um, when it comes to the changes that we made in BMT, 100% of it was because of readiness. We've got to look at building a ready and lethal airman. We had airmen going out there without their weapons called. We sent some airmen out after tech training, not necessarily qualified in PT. That should not be the operational Air Force's problem. So we made those tweaks um, last fall, and we were like, we are not going to send airmen who are not ready. We had healthy discussions, and I can't remember who I was having that with, on, but wait a minute, should we even send airmen out of tech training if we don't feel like they're ready to be an airman? So they might pass all of their functional stuff, but, man, they kind of have a piss-poor attitude. Should we send them out to you guys? I don't think so. So we're working those things out, too, so that we make sure that we support the commanders in that sense. Um, replacing CDCs. How many of your career fields have done that? How many have not? Y'all don't know? How many of your career fields have replaced your CDCs? So those are things we're working with your career field managers. We have close communications, our schoolhouses, with your career field managers. Again, looking back at that video, how do we teach and how do we grow the world's strongest airmen? Maybe CDCs work. I had one career field manager who hit me up and said, hey, Joe, we want to continue doing CDCs because it works for our career field, then great. But if it doesn't, let's expand our minds and quit thinking constrained and let's see what's in the realm of the possible. I talk about the Intel community quite a bit because they're at the front leading edge on looking at how they grow airmen. So they've looked at how they can grow them and they're growing them from, from a holistic view on how do they develop an E1 to an E9 and CDCs wasn't the right fit for them. So they revamped the way they do that. 
So we're looking at how um, we teach differently, train differently, replacing CDCs, eliminating CDCs, modifying, modularizing. We have a whole lot of academic partnerships where we're working with universities and we're working with universities at our schoolhouses to say, can you help us build better things? Can you provide certifications for our airmen who are graduating from tech school? If you graduate tech school at Fort Leonard Wood, you're probably gonna roll out of there if you're a vehicle operator with a commercial driver's license. That's a big deal for those airmen. So we're looking at other certifications that we can provide for your airmen. So talent management. If you consider the, genera if you consider the generation that's coming into today's Air Force, the reality is this, we've gotta look at how we manage talent. And that's not a second Air Force problem alone. That's across our Air Force. Today's airmen will walk with their feet if they don't have purpose in what they're doing. Not that we did it when we all came in, but more so today. So that poses a challenge, because at the end of the day, we've still got to fulfill so many AFSCs. So we've asked our detachment down at Lackland, I, I, I know you've got to fulfill so many seats in finance, in personnel, in medical, in defenders. But at the end of the day, if it can be a win to that airman and a win to the Air Force, they might stay in our Air Force past four years. Maybe. If you don't care about what they want and the win for them, and we just say we got you for four years or six years, they probably aren't going to stay in. They might, we make it a little bit tougher for that leadership team. So we've got to look at talent management and that is a hard thing with a big machine like the United States Air Force. It's a whole lot easier if you're USAA or Google. We can fix you in where your talent is. With our military, it's a little bit more challenging. We've put that challenge on our debt one, and we've said you have got to narrow down choices for our airmen. Airmen that are cross-training out because they couldn't make it in one career field or another, you've got to narrow the chances down. Because even if they only have five choices as a, as, as a person, I'd like to have a choice in those five instead of not. So talent management is a very serious thing because we're looking, again, holistically at retaining an airman too, because otherwise, we're doing it all over again in basic training in four more years. The longer we can retain our airmen, the better it is for our recruiters, the better it is for all of us when it comes to retaining an airman. Okay, so with that, that's kind of where we are in Second Air Force. Lots of changes going on. Um, big rocks that I'm working on, three-year tours. We've been fighting for this probably for about a year and a half. I'm hopeful, Julie Gudgel, we are hopeful <laughs> that in like six months or less, we are going to move the ball across. We believe we've done everything that we need to justify why three-year tours with an opportunity to extend to four for our MTIs, MTLs, tech training instructors, and we even threw the PME instructors in there. Thank you very much. We think that that's important. 74 of your career field managers agree, and they're like, hey, we would rather limit it to three-year tours to get our folks back in the operational um, force quicker. And, oh, by the way, it gives pe more people an opportunity to get into some developmental um, schools. So anyway, so that is my biggest rock. Um, the other one is probably infrastructure. So every single one of your bases has infrastructure problems, every single one of them. I've been in 26 years now. I've never seen the infrastructure challenges that Lackland Air Force Base has. So most of y'all who have been to Lackland probably have seen the nice AMTs and it looks good and it's a gateway, but if you dig a little bit further out and you check out and see where we put our defenders and we house a whole bunch of them, it's a crying shame. And if you see that half of our BMT trainees are still in the same facilities that you and I went through. We've got serious infrastructure problems, um, and the Air Force agrees, so that's another one of my big rocks. 
The other one is, as Chief Lee stated, DSD. We need a DSD review. We've had it out for a few years. There are some components of it that are working well. Personally, I'd rather have a volunteer than somebody that's just simply the most available person. So we will start to work on that um, as our next big rock. So with that, what do y'all have? What comments, questions, concerns do y'all have with respects to BMT, tech training, advanced courses, how we're training, airmen? Sir. How are you doing, ma'am? Sergeant Bolding, uh, 372nd Training Squadron at Shepard. Cool. Oh. So one of the issues that we have is instructor hiring. We have very little, sometimes none, input on the instructors that are hired into our squadron. Yep. Um, we are, we're given a list from AFPC, and they prioritize that list for us. And you we don't even need to finish your statement. Okay. That is changing within the next 30 days. Cool. Thanks, ma'am. So... So his thing is on instructor hiring. We've been talking about that for a while. You get a list from AFPC, here it is. But if I have two more days time on station than you, I'm going to get the job, even if you're more qualified. That's not going to work. The AFPC command chief agrees. We talked about it um, earlier this week. We've been talking about it. That is going to change. So we're going to put the onus on squadron commanders to best decide who, based off that list, are they willing to take and we're lessening the load on what the EPR restrictions are too? Okay. I'm sorry. Oh. I know it. Hey, Chief Chris Craig, I'm a comm squadron superintendent at Shepard. Cool. Uh, I know Chief Hellison, Chief Tool, they worked real hard on the Agile Airman model. Uh -huh. uh, and I, I think it's awesome. Uh, yeah. We've really got to change the way we, we train our cyber folks. Uh, and I think they're really getting after it. But there's some big hurdles there, it seems like, for AETC and yeah. how to implement that model. Um, how far away are we from, from getting there uh, as, a, as me as a squadron superintendent really trying to get that messaging across yeah. and make sure this is as, as painless as possible, yeah. especially as a, with a career field change also with the 1 Delta 7 change. Yeah. Uh, how far is AETC in that fight? You know what I mean? To making that change happen. So we've got a lot of hurdles to fight um, when it comes to how can we be more agile and how we train um, our folks. So, so we see that video and we see how agile folks can be. We, we look at other corporations like USAA, Google, and Apple, and we could go on and on and see how agile they can be in their training. Yet for the United States Air Force and probably some of the other services, you've still got to go through this block then you wait around and oh by the way we have about 800 airmen awaiting training at any given day across all of our bases and then you got to wait for this block that block so the comm folks cyber folks have actually started to break out of the the challenges that we have they had an airman who graduated a cyber course in 18 days versus this 54 days that they took and what we've challenged all of our training groups is break the system. Show us where we've got to work on some things because we're 100% convinced that the assignment system to include all the processes and the system, you know, personnel, human resources systems aren't going to let you because it doesn't understand that this airman has kind of clipped their way through this block and they're moving faster and quicker than that airman. How do we get them through? We've told our folks, especially good fellow, because they tend to move out faster, do it. Move your people through. If there's a way they can clip out of training quicker, do it. Break the system. Force us to look at the processes and the policies that, that are restricting us from moving them on faster. The goal should be train quicker and faster. And if you listen to what General Quast um, continues to push on learn, you know, student-centered learning, that's the model that we've got to go to. So we're not there yet. But I'm encouraging everybody to break the system so that we can make it work. Does, does that answer your question? I, I don't know if that's kind of what I thought, right? Yeah. But are any of the other first fields going down that path? I mean, Intel's about to. Do, do you want to say something, Chief Wright? Oh, I'm, missing, I'm sorry, I missed a question. Oh, he was saying, are there any other career fields that are moving down that route? As far as we understand, Goodfell is uh, kind of leading that, that effort. 
So uh, my question, kind of a comment. So one thing we recently found out is, um, so I'm sure all of us have heard for the uh, en enlisted airmen going through tech school, if they can't make it through two career fields, then they're done. We had heard that rumor, and then recently our commander came back from uh, Tech Training 101 at Keesler, and they said, no, that is not true. Uh, Second Air Force, sta Second Air Force uh, staff said that if the commander truly feels that this airman is worth retaining, giving them a third shot, then please do. So we ha we've we had a couple airmen over the four years I've been at Goodfellow that they were on their second career field and they were separated from the Air Force because we had heard that, that old proverb that two and then you're done. And we recently found out that that is not the case. So we had an airman that religious beliefs, he just could not stand the fact that he's going to be looking at uh, full motion video. So he went through sensor operator training, couldn't make it through. Then they gave him, he was given one and O career field, which he was going to go to the 52nd Special Ops Intel Squadron, looking at the same, staring at the same thing. So he came to us and said, I, I, I just can't. I didn't know I was going to be in another career field where I was doing the same thing. So this was a second. So our commander reached out, second Air Force staff said, if you truly feel he's worth retaining, which the airman is phenomenal, 30 something years old, phenomenal airman. He's a true leader in the dorms to all the, he's an inspiration and he's getting his third shot yeah. because we just found out that it's room. So I just wanted to throw it out there for any, anyone else who had been hearing the same thing. And I think I heard it from one of the speakers uh, earlier this week. They said this, the, the two and then that's it. And I just want to dispel that rumor that second Air Force staff is willing to work. If the airman is worth retaining, commanders can give them a third, fourth, fifth try. So I will tell you, a lot of that empowerment um, comes from General Leahy. General Leahy looks and, and goes to talk to your NCOs and tells them you are empowered. He tells your commanders you are empowered. Commanders should only be doing what commanders are doing. And in that, in that case, whether it be um, retaining airmen in today's Air Force or selecting the best airmen to be instructors, General Leahy's like, put that on the commander to make that risk assessment and decide. And I would tell you, especially to your MTLs and your tech training instructors, your MTIs, your folks are empowered. If you see an airman who should or shouldn't move along, don't wait for a commander who doesn't have touch points with that airman to make that decision. Allow your NCOs to have that empowerment to help us decide what um, the best decisions are. And here's one thing before um, you ask your question. I will tell you, you know, there is, um, so our thought process in Second Air Force Two is a little bit different at this time based on our leadership team. We don't want airmen in our Air Force who don't want to be in our Air Force. I don't care what the numbers are supposed to be. I'm just being real, because at the end of the day, they joined us, we didn't join them, and they might have had an epiphany somehow. And this is a rare exception. If you go to a BMT graduation today, it's probably going to tear you up, because our airmen are extremely proud and committed to be in today's Air Force. Almost all of them feel that same way and that same level of commitment in tech training. Sometimes that motivation and commitment goes down, and most of the time it goes down, it's because they're awaiting training for so long that they don't feel valued, purposeful, they're ready to roll out. But their commitment level is, is still high. But there's gonna be a few occasions where airmen decide, man, this was not the right move for me. We had one two weeks ago that posted it on Reddit. Matter of fact, he had a big old blog, how do I get out of tech training and leave the Air Force? A chief, um, Another fellow chief called me up like 9 o'clock on a Sunday night and said, hey, have you seen this post? You need to take a peek at it. I'm a little bit concerned with this airman. And the airman had some stuff in there, you know, kind of mental health type, whatever. So we end up getting a hold of the first sergeant Sunday night. That airman just out the Air Force effective yesterday. And it was a good move. There were some mental health situations going on. The person didn't want to be here. We could have forced them and sent them out your way, but that's not the right thing to do. So again, we don't look at numbers from, from our vantage. All right, sir. Good morning, Chief. Jeff Glaw, AFPC. I was out of Keesler about a month ago to visit with the cyber instructors and talk oh. about assignments. Um, some of the concerns about going to a three-year tour 
is a, a three-year BOP, a three-year code 50 is not authorized to BOP. Have you engaged with AFPC on trying to get a waiver for uh, instructors if you guys go to yeah. a three-year tour? So we will totally do that, but I'll tell you, people aren't getting their BOPs anyway. I mean, are y'all? Not really. So yes, we, 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 we will engage with them, but it may be you don't get your BOP, but you're out in three years. If you stay your additional fourth year, you get it. So we are, we are tracking that, but I'll tell you, we don't have a high success rate in BOPs anyway. Absolutely, and you should. So to that note, and yes, Chief, to that note, I will tell you guys, if you are ever at one of our wings where your tech training is going on in your core AFSC, whether you're performing in your AFSC or not, I want you to visit your schoolhouses. Who better to inspire and influence somebody than you? So you have an open invitation anytime Engage with your schoolhouse. Go there. Go spend time talking to the next generation. Morning, Chief. So along those same lines, we, we appreciate the three-year tours. Yeah. Uh, huge proponent of that because the operational squadrons have their, have their demands and requirements as well. The longer we keep these guys in tech training, the more their skills diminish, and we, and we want fresh. <clears throat> what, what else can we do to incentivize it, whether it be BOP? whether it be uh, more force distribution in tech training squadrons, whether it be uh, bonus incentives, because it is important. Uh, you know, we agreed. We, we also did away with the DSD. We started going towards equals plus. We want volunteers. Uh, so looking for ideas. How, how do we incentivize tech training instructors? Because it is the right thing to do. Sure. Um, so we don't have enough beer to go around to, ha to have that discussion on how do we incentivize instructor duties. I mean, it, that's, that's for real, like, a hey, we need to be drinking a beer and talking about it because we're talking philosophy now. Um, I will tell you, I think it's a broader question that our Air Force has to decide what they value. Um, and that's not just in this room only. So our office or Officer Corps talks about it a lot. How do we show that we value AETC time, period? And so I'm going to defer that question and punt that to Chief Gudgel um, so that she can maybe share some of her thoughts on that later as, as she closes it up. But I will tell you that we talk about it often. Um, I think there are some leadership things that each of us own within our schoolhouses where we can incentivize it. Uh, Goodfellow is getting at after it in certain ways where now they're, and, and they've just kicked this off, but if you're going to go be an instructor at Goodfell, there's going to be opportunities where you're going to go to school for the first six months, and all you're going to do is go to college. Can everybody do that? Probably not, but what else can we do to incentivize? It's a bigger, broader Air Force picture. And I see Ty Simmons out there. I think he has some thoughts on that, too, so he'll share those later. Yes. to put out the non-vol. We've had to put out the non-vol, which equated to three of our yeah. low-density, high-demand assets yeah. choosing to get out. And, that, and sure. that's, that's their choice. I'd just rather not put that gun to there. So I will tell you, though, I think in general, if you look at promotion boards, so promotion boards value DSDs. They do. When I look at records, right off the bat, I value what they do. Then, it, then you peel it back, and what did they do while they were in that DSD that we should value? Because not everybody in a DSD is performing excellent. So then you got to think about that. That's why we got to drink a beer with that. So, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, Kevin Wilson from Altus Air Force Base. Uh, I'm not in Second Air Force, but uh, I, I still wanted to uh, ask questions about this. Maybe Chief Thompson, you can provide some insight too. So, uh, back to your question, what you said, we have uh, this is a very big problem for us. We have uh, uh, 
Um, we have a, a uh, so I'm a boom operator, uh, instructor boom, and we have about 100 instructors at Altus, and we have a significant problem getting them to come to Altus uh, in a career field that's probably about 700. Uh, so one out of seven comes to Altus uh, for a four-year tour. So um, we've done a few things. Uh, like I, I know that promotion boards um, value that experience. Um, getting the AETC instructor badge now that we can wear that full time afterwards. So when we go back to our units, uh, they're they're more recognized as experts. We also um, all of our instructors will get an additional medal while they're there too. Um, so they get uh, not not more promotion points now that those decoration points are going away, but maybe more uh, incentive for them anyways. But the reason I bring all that up for you, it, it, ma'am, is because you said that. There's talk about going to three-year tours, and you mentioned tech school instructors yeah. as well. Is that extended to FTU instructors? Because uh, I think that would be a big thing. T-coded billets. Okay. Yes. And again, is there a single, how do you, I don't know that we have a single solution on how to incentivize anything in our Air Force. I mean, I'm just being real. So somewhere internally, we've got to do it. Leadership has to has to show it. But the 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 few things we're doing to move the ball down, the three year tours, the the BOPs, as you said, you know, that we value it on promotion boards, which we already do. There there's little things we can do, but yes, it includes all team prefix. We have. I wish I had exact numbers for you, but recently we we hit. Uh, 12 instructors with assignments. This is, these are load masters and boom operators. And out of those 12, I think it was like seven or eight just declined the assignments and got out. And I'm not talking first term airmen either. It's, it's second, second term and career airmen. Okay. Okay. I was going to let you have so mine. I know. Okay. So I, I specifically asked you, Bass, if I can jump on the screen a little bit because I think this is an important point for us as leaders to talk about right here and right now. Uh, you're a part of this enterprise, so I need you guys to understand why this is important. So I'm going to use Altus Air Force Base as a great example. How many of y'all have been to the amazing metropolis of Altus, Oklahoma, right? 19,000 people, two hours west of Oklahoma City, right? Everybody's dying to go there. I'm at 71% manning for air crew instructors at Altus, Oklahoma. 71%. So how do I, as a production engine, create airmen that can go to war fighters and then be presented to a combatant commander if I'm at only at 71% for my instructors in the first place. So I have been engaging with AAPC on this one, and their answer is, well, we're nervous to do that because every time we give a, a tech sergeant or a master sergeant orders, they drop papers. To which my initial response, because I'm kind of an asshole sometimes, is I don't give a shit. Keep going until you get through the self-before-service crowd and get into the folks that are in the game. But I also understand that that's, that's just one perspective in the equation. So trying to be an enterprise leader, and this is where you guys need to start chewing on this in your brains about being an enterprise leader, about being a chief, about being an executive, like Chief Wright said. I also talked to my fellow NAF Command Chief, Chris Simpson, who's 18th Air Force, all mobility Air Forces. And I said, hey, buddy, I need your help. I need you out in your wings. I need you talking about the value of the production engine and the debt that your airmen have to the Air Force. The fact that they have a responsibility to help produce. So you guys are part of this game now too. You have to understand that not all of our bases are in garden spots. Not all of our bases are in the most desirable locations. How many folks are here from you know Hickam, right? Everybody would probably love to be at Hickam. But at the end of the day, we've got to send people to Altus. I need instructors at Holloman, right? We need tech school instructors at San Angelo, Texas. Again, not exactly a garden spot. But it's part of our job as leaders to make sure our NCOs and senior NCOs understand that this is part of the production engine and this is what we do. So please think about that as you think about your position on some of these things. Thanks well, for letting me interrupt. No, well, that's good. Chief Butler. Hey, Chief Sergeant Butler out of uh, Port Wainimi, California. Um, you would think that uh, beautiful California on the beach, palm trees not far from L.A. would definitely bring in um, instructors, but we do have our problem with that too. Um, but the one thing, uh, Chiefs, that I've seen and, and Chiefs, fellow Chiefs, 
uh, is this, is uh, as a career field, our career field manager has started putting an emphasis on giving incentives to uh, instructors and putting an emphasis on DSD, uh, career field vectoring your people uh, for those positions. Um, a lot of times in the past, pr prior to a couple uh, uh, positions before me, my position went there and retired. And so the career field, a lot of times what they have is a bad perception of tech training. Oh, tech tra oh, they, they ain't doing nothing there, and they're not getting promoted and whatnot. But when you start vectoring and putting the right people there, people there that are going to go there and do something and, and be hard chargers, um, then you start bringing attention to the career field, and career field starts looking at, hey, even though it's Altus, hey, I'm going to get promoted, so I'm going to go in and go to Altus, or I'm going to go to Minot because, hey, I can get promoted out of Minot. And so that's what we started doing. I know that our career field manager is, is gaining and pushing towards vectoring the right people that are going to uh, draw attention to the career field or well, to the, the school. But that, that's just something to help, maybe. I don't know. I agree. So it is an enterprise-wide solution. How do we get the best in first command? Um, I will tell you, I am super excited to be in first command. I'm excited that all you guys are leaders in here because at the end of the day, we have an opportunity to create a strong foundation in today's Air Force. We create the strong foundation through basic training, through tech training, we continue that strong foundation through PME, advanced training, et cetera. That's you guys. The strongest thing, the best thing you can bring with you every single day at work, the best thing is a culture and a climate that your NCOs and senior NCOs are thriving. As chief master sergeants, it is full on not about you anymore. It's not. You are there to be the best advisors to your officers and to pick it up and help your NCOs, to, to what Chief E.T. was talking about, to help your NCOs figure out their role and their significance, especially being in this command. And then we're going to pass those good, committed, excited, energized airmen out to our Air Force. And I tell our folks all the time, I don't care if our airmen stay in four years or six years or eight years or 12 years. I don't care. But they've got to deliver for the four years or the six years or the eight years. If you think about most of you sitting in this room, you probably signed up to just do four. Just like me. But somewhere I had highly committed NCOs who poured into and developed me. So 26 years ago, we were in a different Air Force because we had almost 600,000 airmen. If we only have about 321,000 today, that means your job is even harder. And you're going to have to motivate your NCOs and senior NCOs to do their jobs. So it's not about you anymore. I'll be here for a little bit, and, and we'll huddle and talk at Second Air Force um, team. But thank you guys for what you do. Thanks for continuing to serve and being part of our 1%. Thanks for your investment into today's airmen. Whoa.